Hey everybody, it's me, Will, and real quick before we get started, I just wanted to give you a heads up that the audio in this week's episode has a weird hum in the background for the first 14 and a half minutes. Ironically, I'd been trying to fix our audio during our live recording. Somehow those first 14 and a half minutes still ended up sounding weird. You can even skip ahead if it bothers you that much, but the rest of the episode from that point on is completely fine. Now, it's worth pointing out that this is episode 333, halfway to 666. Not only that, we're talking about the Blair Witch herself. Could there be some weird curse at play? I think so. In fact, uh, I guess what I'm trying to tell you is that I refuse to take any responsibility myself. Having said all that, enjoy the show. I don't get it. I don't either. Hello, welcome to Guide to the Unknown. I'm Kristen. And I'm her little brother, William. And this week we are diving even further into Blair Witch lore. Believe it or not, there is even more to get into than we have done in our previous Blair Witch episodes. Some might say we're going too deep. Perhaps I might say that. Yes. Because what we're doing <laughs> I had a feeling, is, yeah. Uh, no, I mean it's still interesting, but uh -huh. it gets less fun. Yes. Yes. This, this, I wouldn't say necessarily the further you go. Maybe I would. I don't know. I, we're going to find out. This is certainly this is certainly the first step beyond the movies. So yeah. we've covered uh, uh, on Guide to the Unknown. And actually, I did something last night that I didn't even tell you about. What did you do? Right now, if you go to our website, scaryfun.fun, toss a little thing on the end of that URL. Type in slash Blair Witch. Oh, cool. You're going to get a landing page for every episode we're doing about the Blair Witch. Sweet. Because in the past we've covered, uh, starting with episode 300, we covered the Blair Witch Project and Curse of the Blair Witch, which was the first TV special, which enhanced all of this lore mm -hmm. um, about Ellie Kedward and Robin Weaver, Eileen Treacle. These things are supposedly um, said to have occurred in the town of Burkittsville a couple hundred years ago, contributing to the Blair Witch lore. Um, we covered that. Yep. We covered Book of Shadows, Blair Witch 2. Hell yeah, we did. Most recently, we just went ahead and finished out the movies by covering the 2016 Blair Witch, which is essentially Blair Witch 3, mm -hmm. kind of. Meaning, for this episode, we're, we're leaping back in time. Right. We're going back to the year 2000, which is really where the Blair Witch stuff started to explode. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, because the Blair Witch Project was so successful and so popular um whoever you know the the powers that be whoever was uh, in charge of it at the, at the time i think artisan i guess was like oh great put all your money in blair witch stuff right which is so surprising to me very surprising so what we're talking about this week is some of that rush to create as much blair witch material as possible mm -hmm. we're going to be covering as you know if time allows we're going to be covering the blair witch chronicles comic book series it's four issues of an anthology comic book each with their own sort of extensions of the Blair Witch lore yep. it's almost like uh, just different scary things happening in Burkittsville yes right? we're going to be covering um, the uh, oh boy what's it called the Burkittsville 7 the, it's a I long think it's name. the massacre of the Burkittsville 7 yes the massacre of the Burkittsville 7 the Blair Witch Legacy mm -hmm. which is another made for TV special that is supposed to flesh out more of the uh the lore of the Blair Witch, but in my estimation, complicates things greatly while making you feel bad. What a headache. <laughs> we'll get there. This thing is. It's like a headache in audiovisual form. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I, I don't disagree. Yeah. We'll get there. <laughs> and I also read a novel. Yeah. For this week's episode. Do you look at this at all? Yes. You did look at I, this? I, I like kind of, I looked stuff up about it. Okay. So I have like a glancing overview of it, but I didn't read the whole thing. Okay. Uh, yeah. I read the book, The Secret Confessions of Rustin Parr. Right. I have a question. Where does the Blair Witch dossier fit into this? The Blair Witch dossier was the first Blair Witch book, and it right. came out to coincide with the original movie. Okay, because we have read that just in general in the yeah. past, and that I like. We touched on bits and pieces of it in 300 and 301. Right. We could do a, a, a more thorough we deep don't dive if you're interested. We don't necessarily need to, but I was just curious about where that fit in with the release of all these other things. Yes, very yeah. early on, mm -hmm. um, the Blair Witch dossier, there's like an example of, I'm almost thinking of um, what we're covering this week 
and especially if we keep going with our Blair Witch like deep dives, yeah, we're getting into like the the tertiary lore. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. Most people know the movies. Undeniably, most people just know the Blair Witch movies. Yeah, people seem to love and revere the first one, as I do. Mm -hmm. People have dumped on the second one appropriately <laughs> though i also love it sure and people know blair witch 2016 which i think is pretty polarizing mm -hmm. then that's the that's the primary lore that's what most people know then yeah. you get into like the secondary lore where you get into what you just talked about the 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 blair witch project dossier which came out with the first movie but fleshed out that world so much with reports of like somebody did soil samples in the woods and found opium mm -hmm. residue in there which implies could Heather, Mike, and Josh have been having some sort of hallucination out there rather than this being supernatural witchcraft? Right. It, it's it's that sort of poking holes in the the paranormal outlook mm -hmm. that I think the dossier is wonderful for. Yeah. Or, I don't know, it also sort of like... It, it doesn't always poke holes like it has pages from Heather's journal or diary mm -hmm. where she is actually a little bit more into the witchcraft angle than you see in the movie. Yes. Um, and so it almost kind of like nurtures that side of things. And there's also a psychic that they bring out to the woods. Who True. I think is going to be sort of like hammy and sort of faking it. But like seemingly real things happen with the psychic that, you know, the cops and other people who were going out there with her can't really explain um the dossier kicks complete ass uh, the dossier is wonderful yeah i would say that if you're into the movie the dossier is such a great like companion book yeah and that's why it's the secondary lore to me yeah most people aren't going to mm -hmm. but if you do you'll be rewarded and that again is why i say we're getting into the tertiary lore here definitely Starting with the, what do you want to start with? I mean, we'll get to it in just a moment, but I do want to just lay the groundwork that what we're going to be talking about in this episode, I think, is the beginning of what I'm thinking of as like the deep lore. Mm -hmm. You don't need to go this deep. No. 99% of people are not going to go this deep. No, we will do it for you. We're so going to do it. You don't have to. Good point. Yeah. Uh, but because we're going this deep, we're going to we're going to do as much as we can with it. <laughs> um, but this is the stuff that I really think most people don't know about. Mm-hmm and wouldn't feel is rewarding of their interest in the Blair Witch. Yeah. But I can find bits and pieces of these things to appreciate for what they intend and what they're supposed to mean. Yes, I think that's <laughs> certainly true. What I would like to start with is the documentary and how that intersects with the confessions of Rustin Parr that you read. Perfect. I'm interested in the Brodies. Yes. Okay. Very good. All right. So then that's where we're going to begin. We're going to yep. start with the massacre of the Burkittsville seven, the Blair Witch legacy mm -hmm. after this commercial break. Okay. So before we get into it all the way, Will, I just want to touch on something we had talked about in a previous episode, the fact that we were going to be appearing at the 25th anniversary. Yes screening of the Blair Witch Project in Burkittsville, Maryland. Correct. We did say that. We did say that. William, do you have anything else to say about that at this time? Oh, interesting. Thank you so much for asking me, Chrissy. <laughs> um, so as it turns out, the, the, the Blair Witch 25th anniversary screening in Burkittsville is, I believe, on September 15th. Correct me if it, I'm wrong. I'll try to put a link in the show notes. It's the 15th. It's the 15th? Yes. Now, as it turns out, that appears to be the exact day um, that my second child is due. Yeah. My wife, Allie, is pregnant. Baby mm. brother, as we're currently referring to this child, mm -hmm. is due in mid-September. Yeah. I'm having another kid, everybody. Isn't that so exciting? I'm going to be a dad. I'm Again. <laughs> I'm thrilled. Yes. For you guys. I've yes. been dying for you to tell I know, I know everybody and that's why i queued it up thank you very much yeah, yeah, doing yeah. That. it does of course throw a huge monkey wrench into the notion of being present for the 25th anniversary of the blair witch project it does but it's totally worth it i will say this i'd love to do that yeah. i'm gonna go ahead and prioritize my, my family and the birth of my child yeah ahead of that fair. if that's okay with you it's absolutely okay with me i will also be prioritizing that i could of course go 
sure. without you. Yeah. But I will not. Oh, okay. No. Um, uh, <laughs> because I want to be around for this. Yes. Uh, yeah. I guess I should also reach out to the organizers. Mm. Yeah, we will. Yeah, Michael, I'll be getting in contact with you. The mayor of Burkittsville, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, we're not gonna we're not gonna be present. Right. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> so be it. Yeah. So be it. Yeah. Um, all right. Okay. Now, so having gotten that out of the way, let's get into the exciting. really important stuff. Yeah, right, of course. The Massacre of the Burkittsville 7, the Blair Witch Legacy. This follows the other two TV specials, which were, of course, Curse of the Blair Witch yep. on the Sci-Fi Channel, which mm -hmm. led up to the release of the original movie, which I think is just about perfect. Yeah, it kicks ass. And Sticks and Stones an exploration of the Blair Witch legend, I believe it's called. Yeah, something like that. Which was like a Blair, uh, a blockbuster exclusive, which almost feels like deleted scenes from mm -hmm. Curse of the Blair Witch, which is good. Yeah. This is the third TV special. Yes. I'll just tell you this. The reason it exists is that uh, one year after the Blair Witch Project uh, uh, hit theaters, it was about to premiere on Showtime. So the powers that be at Showtime said it would be great if we had a Curse of the Blair Witch-esque mm -hmm. documentary. They're getting as much juice out of this thing as they could. Yes. But also, I mean, that is awesome. It's awesome. Theoretically. The well, I know. I know. Yeah. Uh, so they were saying, let's produce our own documentary that deepens further the lore of the Blair Witch. Mm -hmm. And uh, it'll be in the run up to the premiere of Blair Witch Project on Showtime. Yeah. So they tapped... Ben Rock to write and direct these things. Ben Rock is the guy that put runes in Rustin Parr's house. Mm -hmm. I believe he's the guy that put the children's handprints on Rustin Parr's house ah. in the Blair Witch Project. Ben Rock was central to developing some of the deep lore stuff yeah. of the Blair Witch Project with Eduardo Sanchez and Dan Myrick, Daniel Karcher, mm -hmm. all these people. Um, so it makes total sense. And I feel like it's actually properly respectful of the franchise and his plays in it to turn to this guy and say, Hey, you make a TV special that deepens the lore. Yeah, that is totally true. And he pitched to them. I think the, I think the, like the, like three word pitch is fine. Mm -hmm. And I want to be, I don't want to walk this line of like, just trying to dance around it. Unfortunately, I did not like this documentary. Yeah. But he essentially pitched to showtime. What I want to do is everybody knows if you're into the Blair Witch, this idea of Rustin Parr, a guy who in the 40s um, turned himself in saying, I'm finally finished uh -huh. because he had kidnapped eight kids and killed seven of them. The only kid who remained alive, Kyle Brody, talked about like I was made to stand facing the corner while Rustin Parr killed the other seven. And was it because, as Rustin Parr said, the voice of an old woman told him to do it? Was Rustin Parr working at the behest of the witch? Mm -hmm. So Ben Rock says to Showtime, I want my documentary to poke holes in that history. I want to flip it on its head and say Rustin Parr did not kill those kids. In fact, the only sole living kid, Kyle Brody, was the mastermind. Right. And I want this all to uh, be hinged on a fake 1960s documentary called White Enamel, which was an expose of life inside a mental institution mm -hmm. where Kyle Brody lived out the rest of his days before he killed himself. Yeah. That, I think, is an ambitious, mm -hmm. admirably ambitious goal for okay. this thing. Yeah. And then in practice, it is a, a feel-bad... <laughs> <laughs> yeah a feel bad documentary that turns the blair witch lore into like swiss cheese yeah i mean ambitious sure i find it to be too much i don't understand why you would take the central story of the blair witch and undo it yeah. in this like yeah. it just kind of turns everything on its head in a way that seems really unnecessary especially yes. as something that's meant to compliment the debut of the Blair Witch Project on the network like to watch this first you're like wait what the hell I know what does this mean you know what I mean yeah um it, I mean it's cool the idea of having within this special this documentary another fictional documentary that's taking a look at you know the mental hospital that Kyle Brody was in like it, in that way yes it is ambitious and like unique and kind of cool to go that far 
Um, but yeah, the central conceit of it is like, why would you do that? I know. And this is something that this tertiary canon, tertiary lore, whatever, mm -hmm. does constantly. I also don't totally understand what is considered canon and what isn't. Because I read yes. that this is canon, and yet what you read and I didn't, the Confessions of Rustin Parr, is not considered canon. Right, well... Like, why? And who decides this? And even though... The Confessions of Rustin Parr is written by D.A. Stern. Who wrote the dossier. Right. So it's not like the Confessions of Rustin Parr is like Dramione fanfic or something that you're like, okay, that's not can't. What, what did you say to me? <laughs> okay. This is an extremely popular, I would say probably the most popular. I know nothing about fan fiction. Okay. But there is Draco and Hermione fan fiction that is unbelievably popular. From online. Harry Potter. Yes, from Harry Potter unbelievably popular popular online but it's not canon even though like maybe millions of people have read it ah um, okay so yeah and that's kind of top of mind because i was just reading something about how there is a super popular one that is called manacled about draco and hermione and they're doing this thing there's this practice that i didn't know about that I can't remember the name of, but basically they strip out the um, the specificity of it being about like Draco and Hermione or whatever, and they're going to repackage it as just another story. So like okay. the same way that they talk about how um, Twilight is actually, or no, excuse me, Fifty Shades of Grey is Twilight fan fiction. Yes. It's that kind of process. So they're going to take this and make it into something Remove else. Remove any direct references to the IP Harry Potter mm -hmm. yeah, and yeah, have yeah. it be its own standalone thing. There's a name for it. I can't. Yeah. But um, but yeah, so it's not like that's obviously not canon. Okay. Yeah. Right. Manacled. Yes. Even though it is super duper duper popular. So I was thinking of it in terms of this because, first of all, I was just reading about it. But also, it's not like it was written by some rando. Right. The Confessions of Rustin Parr. Right. And it's not canon for that reason. Right. It was written by the guy who wrote the Blair Witch Project dossier. Which so seems to be, be canon. Yeah. Which seems to go hand yeah. in hand with all the lore around the Blair Witch Project. Yeah. I, I view it this way. Mm -hmm. there, there are some perspectives on, on canon Right, I think the the big one that I keep coming back to is is Star Wars. I think Star Wars is set set like a thousand templates for for fandom interacting with the creative yeah. story itself. So for a million years, any time a new book was written in the Star Wars franchise, also Eduardo Sanchez is a mega Star Wars fan, so oh, this cool. is double appropriate. Mm -hmm. His entire basement is like filled with his Star Wars collection. Nice. Uh, any time a book was written in the Star Wars world, it was said that it had to be approved by George Lucas ah. because he was the the holder of the keys yeah. to that universe. So he could say what things did or did not happen. Therefore, everything was canon. Right, right. Yeah. Then Disney bought Star Wars and all those books, mm -hmm. everything was erased from canon. Right. Yeah. Because Disney was going to want to tell stories that might contradict those events mm -hmm. so those became known as like star wars legends yeah. i want to say maybe not true still good stories but not true for the story going forward yes my perspective is as follows it's great for the person who holds the keys to the kingdom to say that's canon that's not that's canon that's not you want to buy into that mm -hmm. ultimately i do think that the audience's interpretation of events is bigger than the creator's perspective on their own work. Yeah. Which is weird. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I pick and choose what I think is canon or not. Yeah. Based on whether or not I like it or whether or not it fits my perspective of this work. Yeah. I think that's true. I think that it also nags at me a little bit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I do think that's true. It's, it's also the downside <clears throat> of having something that is so popular that mm -hmm. it gets to have this expanded universe material and really right. Blair Witch bizarrely I always say like Blair Witch is one of those things where like you don't think of it as a franchise you think of it as a movie yeah but then when you if you do look closer the way that we have been there are dozens of books and comics yeah, and humongous. games and it's, it's gigantic mm -hmm. so if you're lucky enough to have something so popular that you get all this extended material it's just the nature of the game. Things are going to contra contradict themselves. Right. What I've always loved about the Blair Witch uh, material is that it is 
perfectly constructed for things to contradict themselves because it's all about yes. folklore, urban legends, and people who disagree mm -hmm. on what really happened. Yeah, totally. And that, to bring it back to this documentary, is what I can at least respect about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, they are arguably, you could view this as changing the Rustin Parr story to say he was innocent. Mm -hmm. But I think intelligently what Ben Rock actually did was that he created a character who views things that way. Oh, okay. And had yeah, everyone else disagree with him. Mm -hmm. So the movie opens with this guy, Chris Carrasco. He's the character in the movie that essentially, he's an archivist in this world. Yeah. And he insists from his study of history that Rustin Parr was innocent. That's true, but it's like all from that point of view. It's, I yes. mean, so you can say that and it is true, mm -hmm. but there's no opposing viewpoints. Well, there are constant like, opposing but viewpoints, like, it, but they're given less with, air. Yeah, and it, the conclusion is still kind of that it's like Kyle Brody. Everything is still gearing toward that yeah. conclusion. Yes. So, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. It doesn't mm -hmm. come across in a way that feels like people debating something. Right. It comes across like this guy is revealing an inconvenient truth that other yeah. people can't or don't want to believe but right. is right. And those opposing viewpoints almost come across as like, yeah, of course it's fair to let people say their piece on this, but we actually know that like this has been revealed and this is what it is. Yes. So here's what the, the I think the most damning piece of evidence in the documentary that Rustin Parr was innocent mm -hmm. is the... This documentary and the book, The Secret Confessions of Rustin Parr, which I have right there. Mm -hmm. I, I, I pulled out all the stuff that we're literally talking about if you want to yeah. reference them at any point. Yeah. But uh, there is a priest named Dominic Kazale. Mm -hmm. He's a former priest. He is said to be the guy who in the 1940s, before Rustin Parr was hanged for killing all these kids, heard Rustin Parr's final confession. And in that final confession... Supposedly, Rustin Parr told Dominic Kazale, I've never killed anybody. Yeah. That's what's damning. Mm -hmm. If if this were all up to interpretation of a guy who's like into crime, as this, uh, the guy who kicks it off, who has a very similar name, all disease make it. I know. Name. Yes. Chris Carrasco, mm -hmm. the archivist who says Rustin Parr was probably innocent and Kyle Brody did it. If he were more presented as somebody who is obsessive and digging into the history, um, but doesn't have anything to back it up except his own theories, that would be one thing. Yeah. But by pulling in somebody else who has material evidence, this priest, Dominic Kazale, who's like, Rustin Parr told me he never killed anyone. Yeah, but there are all kinds of killers who just go to the grave insisting that they didn't do it. That's true. Yeah. That's true. So actually, you're, you're, you're making another argument for this documentary appropriately waffling on history rather than outright saying Rustin Parr was innocent. No, but they treat that as though it's evidence. Even you just now were like, so they, they show that the priest says, yeah, he said he didn't do it Yeah, you're right. because it's presenting it. So like, as it's so much law that you take that in yeah. unless you step back and go, yeah, so yeah, people lie all the time. No, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. There's another weird thing about Blair, Witch: the more that you poke at what's already been created. Yeah. Right. Like, Rustin Parr, my thing with Rustin Parr was always this, and it never needed to be more than this. Yeah. Um, the Blair Witch Project, Heather, Mike, and Josh are going into the woods to find out about the Blair Witch. On the way, they interview people who mostly tell them about Rustin Parr. Right. And when they go into the woods, even though the movie's called The Blair Witch Project, and even though everything is witch, 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 witch. It's the Rustin Parr show, baby. It's the Rustin Parr show. Rustin Parr's ghost is the villain of mm -hmm. The Blair Witch Project. I did um I did an interview I did two things with Eduardo Sanchez that I don't think are online. Mm -hmm. Hunt a killer squashed a, a million things that we did for that box. Mm -hmm. Uh I worked on a box thing is what I'm re referencing. Yeah, it was a game, a uh, Blair Witch Project game that yeah. you is like an interactive thing and there were elements to it where you could get access to an interview that Will did with Eduardo Sanchez yeah. and other things too, but they didn't necessarily follow up on those like interactive internet elements. Yes. So they're like not really out and about now. Yes. Although I'm working on archiving that as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I, in talking to Eduardo Sanchez, I brought out a theory, which was, is Rustin part of the villain of the Blair Witch Project? My theory is perhaps he was the most recent thing at that time that had 
happen in the woods. Yeah. And therefore his spirit had the most energy. Like, again, almost my theory of, like, the longer you're dead, the weaker you get. Mm -hmm. Rustin Parr was the most recent dead villain in those woods. Yeah. Therefore, his ghost has the most power to sway Heather, Mike, and Josh, bring them to his house. Mm -hmm. Kill them by putting Mike in the corner, as it said that he did with his victims in right. the 40s. And he was like, I like that. Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. But Eduardo Sanchez, having said that, that's not to pat myself on the back. Eduardo mm -hmm. Sanchez is, I think, wonderfully charitable about people's interpretations. Mm -hmm. That's just mine. And maybe if I had said something completely insane, he would have also been like, yeah, interesting. I don't know. I mean, hard to say, hard really. To say. But yeah. also, I think he probably, just from the little things that I've seen, because I definitely haven't like gone as extensively as you have, it seems like he gets a kick out of hearing other people's things. Like, it seems like as opposed to like George Lucas or something. Yeah. I don't think he cares that much about the idea of canon and stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah, like it seems like he's he's interested in hearing people's interpretations. Well, fingers so, crossed. I yeah. can give a nudge about something. It's not exclusive to me. It's not mm -hmm. an exclusive here. Yeah. But supposedly something's happening this year. Yeah, I saw that. And too. perhaps Eduardo Sanchez may be involved. Mm -hmm. It might be a new release of the original movie with all these deleted scenes people have been begging for for 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, it may be a new a new entry in the franchise mm -hmm. i don't know but supposedly something big is coming and I'm, i'll be very curious to see exactly that raj yeah i want to see how it does or does not discredit yeah this deep lore stuff i think you could discredit all this stuff fine i think you could too but but more to my point of like i, I think all these things discredit themselves yeah Right, definitely. Like, there's there the more that you focus on Rustin Parr specifically, the less rewarding it becomes. I completely agree. Um, yeah, new things have to happen for it to feel fresh. Mm -hmm. But there are only so many times that you can be like, and it happens at the beginning of this documentary too, where the the conspiracy theory guy Chris Carrasco is like. 1785, Ellie Kedward is uh, found guilty of witchcraft and hanged. And then 50 years later, Eileen Treacle. And then 15 years later, Robin Weaver. And then in the 40s, you get rest in part. Like, it's this condensed, rushed Star Wars title crawl of like, <laughs> here's the lore. Yeah. And it's like, that's all there is. Right. Th there's We don't have more than that. No. And this documentary doesn't have the freedom to tell a whole new story. Mm -hmm. So instead, it has to pick at these old stories. Yeah. And by doing that, by saying the stories that we've heard are not true mm -hmm. part of me goes like yeah because stories are malleable and even the truth is a fiction what's reported in the news might be considered truth but the actual event might have differed that part of my brain sort of enjoys it but yeah, then it's the, creating a whole new story out of a story you already knew so you're kind of creating more material out right. of what's already there but they don't have the clearance or ability to go so far as to confirm that things are different than what everyone believed yeah. All they can do is fence sit. Mm -hmm. So they can pick at all these strands of little stories and draw our attention to them so often that you yeah. get, you're like, this again? Yeah. Rustin Parr again? Mm -hmm. um, but then they have to sit on the fence by the end. They can never outright state a, a clear con conclusion because it would change things too much. Yeah. So you get this spinning tires thing about these extended bits of lore. Yeah. We're just like, we're just going over the same ground. Yeah. Yeah. Like Heather, Mike, and Josh walking through those woods, covering the same ground over and over. The fallen tree again? Yes. Are you kidding me? We've been walking in circles all day. Okay. This is starting to get ridiculous. <laughs> um, I would also, besides the, the information posited in this documentary, I would be remiss not to mention the woodwinds. Oh constantly my God. playing yeah. mm -hmm. below everybody speaking. Yep. And the... Ooh, ah, singing in the background all the time. It was doing my head in. It was, it as was, the British might say. Yes, it. This was a rough watch. It was horrible for the brain, <laughs> horrible for the head. It was just like an embodiment yeah. of a headache or my brain when it's feeling especially busy. Like I, you know, when you just have like, like thoughts on top of thoughts. I'm like thinking one thing, and I have a song stuck in my head, and like this, and they're just like all layered up. It was like that, but on the screen. I was like, ah, I know. Ah. <laughs> it is a bit of, uh, I, of an assault. I, it's a sensory assault. It's terrible. Uh, yeah, it's been a long time since I've seen this. Yeah, the I'd never I, seen this, before. and I'd never watched it to dissect. Yeah, you know. But the second that I put it on, I was like, ooh, this is not gonna be good for Chrissy. <laughs> this is not Chrissy's kind of thing at all. No. Uh uh. <laughs> no, I did I, not like that. Um. 
yeah and then there and then you get into the the mental institution stuff which i was like if kristen doesn't shut this off i didn't i didn't really no i didn't good for you i didn't like it at all i don't want to see white enamel i'll tell you that uh yeah so white enamel is this 1960s documentary that supposedly you know it's it's in the world of blair witch Mm -hmm. in the 1960s someone did a documentary about a mental institution and kyle brody is in some of the footage yeah uh and so they use archival footage of this fake documentary white enamel in the documentary the massacre of the birkinsville seven right and uh that is not dissimilar from curse of the blair witch using footage from you know that 70s yeah totally you know spiritualist show or right. whatever it's in it's in keeping with the mockumentary style the fake documentary style no it totally is yeah but seeing a gritty brutal unpleasant expose of a mental institution for so long Ugh. where uh the 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 patients are literally being marched naked down the hallway and are writhing like the in their rooms. Thing. yeah i know it's Ugh. like the what was that called willowbrook yeah mm-hmm. it is like the geraldo documentary yeah. it's like i don't want to look at this no why'd you it's, make it up the geraldo thing was real and it was terrible enough it's unpleasant why'd you make it up so this was a reference to ben rock cited that he had uh he did a whole i i love ben rock is wonderful mm-hmm. uh, let me say that yeah um not just to offset how brutal i find this experience <laughs> to be but he he i love i really admire and and recognize in him how passionate he is about his contributions to the Blair Witch. And they yeah, are I mean, that's awesome. numerous. I mm-hmm. mean, he did create some of like the pseudo law of the folklore. Right. The malleable law of the folklore. Um, but he talked about how he had pitched like the documentary uh, of the mental institution is based on another real life documentary called Titty Cut Follies, which I'd never seen before. But no. so he was referencing something real, which is appropriate. Mm-hmm. But It's a feel bad experience and there's so much of it that it just makes me feel bad. There's more of it than I expected there to be. Uh, Kyle Brody nude in his room, Mm -hmm. like clawing at the walls and hopping on the mattress. It's like, it's brutal. Yes, it is. To watch. Yeah. Kyle Brody. Kyle Brody. (laughs) I, uh, so the, the big exposés from the documentary are as follows. Uh, uh, Kyle Brody kept chanting to himself in his room. Never given, never given. People phrase it like that. Never given. Yeah. G-I-V-E-N. It's mm-hmm. plain to me that they're trying to play with like, is he really saying never give in? Oh. Right? But they don't come down one way or the other. Yeah. Supposedly, this is what Rustin Parr shouted to himself right. prior to him, to being hanged. Right. Um, and also, uh, Kyle Brody is drawing on paper during the documentary, mm-hmm. and he is writing in the witch cipher. Yes. <laughs> uh, I mean, that slaps. You like that? I mean, I love a witch cipher. Transitus fluvii. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which are the runes from Rustin Parr's house. It's a lost dead language that was used by witches. Right. These like carved symbols and stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that is uh, used by this uh, Chris Carrasco archivist conspiracy theorist to be proof like Kyle Brody knows witch stuff. Right. So young Kyle Brody killed those kids. Right. Um. And it also ties into Rustin Parr's house having those runes all over it. Yeah. And that the runes themselves literally tie into the book that I read. Okay. We're going to take a break real quick. Yeah. I have questions about the book. Yes. All right. Okay. All right. All right. So real quick. Um, well, not that quick. <laughs> um, we want to make sure you know about patreon.com slash GTTU pod. Um, this is where you can support the show if you like it. And it means the world to us. It really makes a huge difference in our lives. So thank you so much to everybody who supports us already. And when you do that, you get access to a bunch of really cool stuff. We actually have a whole second podcast called The Netherworld Dispatch that comes out every Monday. So people on our highest tier, the demon tier, get those episodes weekly. And then we have a number of different tiers that you can check out, see what works for you. You can get those episodes either um, twice a month or you can get them once a month. We even have a $1 tier for people who would just get, like to get access to our Discord, which is totally awesome, has cool people talking in it every day um it rules and also in our patreon we have um what's it called 
commentaries. I was say testimonies. <laughs> testimonies. We, <laughs> we, we testify on a few commentary tracks mm-hmm. for the Blair Witch Project, Book of Shadows, Blair Witch 2. Yeah. Uh, presumably Blair Witch 3 is going to come someday. Yeah. Um, as well as, I mean, well, we'll just leave it at Blair Witch for now. We've got commentaries for the first two Blair Witch movies plus other franchises. Scream movies and Twilight. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so go check that out. Patreon.com slash GTTU pod. Um, it truly makes a difference uh, for us very materially in our lives. Yes. Um, thank you so much. We really appreciate your support. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll keep the Blair Witch stuff flowing. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, once again, scaryfun.fun slash Blair Witch. You can find direct links to those Patreon exclusive shows. Because mm-hmm. we've That's also awesome. done some Patreon stuff in the Blair Witch yes. realm on the Netherworld Dispatch. Um, and all the other Guide to the Unknown episodes that we've covered Blair Witch. So go check that out. That's awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, um, we'd also love it if you'd consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or giving us some stars on Spotify. I've got a review for us right here from iJohn32 titled Spooky Fun, which is very close to our company yeah. name, Scary Fun. Guide to the Unknown has quickly become my favorite podcast. It really comes through that the hosts are having a great time, and it shows in the way they appreciate their fans. The show is a great backdrop for a drive, curling up with a cat, and painting miniatures. I'm writing this while letting a layer of paint dry on a star spawn. Oh, I love that. Keep up the good work, hosts. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Hi John. Five stars. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. We would really appreciate any support you can give us to share the show, help get the word out there. Kristen's been writing wonderful articles weekly Mm -hmm. on Bloody Disgusting. Yeah. BloodyDisgusting.com. Every time a new episode of the show drops, Kristen's got a mini article over there. Yeah. um, Which is super fun. Yeah, Um, it's cool. uh, We could really, really use your support. And many of you do already. And thank you so, so much. Yeah, you guys really rule. Last thing of the break. And then we'll get right back to the Blair Witch. A little commercial break. See you in a minute. Okay. Yes. So I read, just kind of like digging around on Reddit and stuff, that Carol Brody, Kyle Brody's mother, is yep. mentioned in the Confessions of Rustin Parr as being witchy herself. I didn't get it from reading the book. Oh, okay. Okay. So, but do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. I know what you're referring to. Okay. It does not land for me. All right. The, so, yeah, what's the deal? The book is odd. Okay. <laughs> Again, let me just set up like the premise. Sure. So D.A. Stern is the author of The Secret Confessions of Rustin Parr. He's also the author of uh, both Blair Witch dossiers for the original movie and for Book of Shadows. I've really enjoyed his work. Yeah. Really enjoyed his work. And I have to say, I liked this book. Um, it did, again, feel like uh, something about everything we're covering this week. Everything feels very like... Oh, also, mm-hmm. here's some more Blair Witch stuff if you want it. Yeah. You know? But this book is set up with D.A. Stern himself being contacted by uh, um, that priest, that former priest from the documentary, Dominic okay. Dominic Kazale. Mm-hmm. Dominic Kazale, after the Burkittsville 7 documentary, lights himself on fire. Oh, okay. So... The poli- he survives. Yeah. But the police lay out to D.A. Stern. Not only did he light himself on fire, he killed his wife in that fire. Oh. He splashed, specifically splashed gasoline all over her as she sat in a chair and then lit up their home. Oh. Why would he do something like that? He didn't seem like that kind of guy. He believed Rustin Parr um, was... Uh, it's it, it set up by D.A. Stern. He's like, I don't know why Dominic Cazale flip-flopped. Mm-hmm. At some point, he agreed that Rustin Parr was guilty, and then he started to insist that Rustin Parr couldn't hurt a fly. Hmm. What's the story? And so we almost set off on this. It reminded me almost of um, we had read The Exorcist books yeah. for our old podcast, Book Club, Schmook Club. Mm-hmm. Um, and there is a detective in that, uh, Detective Kinderman, I believe yeah. his name is. And it's like his job is to understand what happened in these exorcist crime cases and he doesn't want to believe that the devil was involved. Right. D.A. Stern has a similar job that he gives his, the character version of himself. Yeah. Um, he never comes down one way or another if he believes the Blair Witch is real or not. Mm-hmm. But he believes that other people believe it. Right. So what can that tell us about why Dominic Cazale 
would kill his wife and try to kill himself in a fire. And that's kind of interesting. Yeah. That's a suitably interesting mystery to set up. 50% of the book is him trying to figure that out. Okay. The second 50% of the book is Dominic Cazale mailed a his own journal to D.A. Stern, and it took a while to get to him. And then the second half of the book is just pages from Dominic Cazale's journal. <laughs> okay. It seems weird to call this the Confessions of Rustin Parr. Correct. Okay, yeah. I it mean, it sounds like half of them are, I'm assuming, from Cazale's journal or whatever. Right. But the, 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 con- the literal confessions of Rustin Parr are yeah. like the MacGuffin of this book. Uh-huh. It's like how, once again, Star Wars, it's like, um, uh, I'll go to The Force Awakens for this. Please. Right? Like, they're trying to find where Luke Skywalker is. They've got to find the map to Luke Skywalker. Mm-hmm. The entire adventure is about getting the map to Luke Skywalker. And then in the last five seconds, they get to Luke Skywalker. Yeah. This entire book is like, what was the confession? What did Rustin Parr say to Dominic Uh, Cazale that would set Dominic Cazale up to, you know, 50 years later, 60 years later, mm -hmm. set himself and his wife on fire? And then you find out in the last handful of pages. Oh. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that okay. generally. The the confession itself is what kicks off the adventure, so to speak. Mm-hmm. What's weird to me is that it's like this is about D.A. Stern and his investigation and interacting with the police and uh, and interviewing people who had been interacting with Dominic Cazale. Mm-hmm. And then the second 50 percent is like, here's just his diary where it yeah. just explains it all. Huh. It's weird to me. Sounds weird. But it does lay out. That Rustin Parr, what we already said, said in his final confession, I never killed anybody. Right. It does contribute to the belief that Kyle Brody was behind it all. Okay. But I almost think that this was a charge that D.A. Stern was given. Find a way. And I think D.A. Stern is really good at the historical fiction stuff. Like, oh, really yeah, based good. On- the dossier mm-hmm. is, like, incredible. Yes. And I think that this book is the best depiction possible of a bad idea Mm -hmm. of now seemingly making it true that rustin parr was innocent right and kyle brody did it all what a weird thing to decide to i don't know yeah another thing that we haven't said yeah and everything that we read this week for the show Mm -hmm. and watched contributes to the most problematic part of the blair witch trying to convince the audience that the movie The Blair Witch Project itself is fictional. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, it, it drives me crazy. Right. I know. Um, but it seems to be required. There is a quote in the documentary from Chris Carrasco who says, These kids, Heather, Mike, and Josh, these kids aren't missing. They aren't dead. This is just a sick joke that's like the kind of stuff that sad, sick people form around these kinds of events. Right. Yeah. So he's saying the movie wasn't real. Yeah. Right. And then in the book, um, they again have to talk about how like the the movie may not be true at all. Uh-huh. Which is like I, I know, I don't know why would you make the movie The Blair Witch Project and then the the governing body who owns it and can control it how wants strange. to bend over backwards to say it didn't happen. Yeah. It's really not until the 2016 movie. I forgot that that guy said that in the documentary. That's right. It's like Book of Shadows being like, yes. newsflash, people. That was just a movie. I know, and I completely glossed over it. It is so puzzling to me why you'd go so hard on trying to say the Blair Witch Project didn't happen. That's what people liked. Yeah, that's what they like about that's it. That's what it got us so in the real. door was that it was real. Yeah, there was a website that made it seem like it was a real life thing. What are you doing? I don't know. And yet everything here, even the comic books, Mm -hmm. they go out of their way to say that original 1999 movie was fictional. Right. I don't get it. I don't either. The best I can figure is the the lawsuit stuff. I was about to say, it seems like maybe there's some sort of like... I don't know. They're covering their asses in some sort of weird way. They legally can't dwell on that documentary too much. Yeah. Uh, Heather Donahue uh, now uses the name Ray Hans. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, specifically, was like it's weird to me that now my name yeah. is the legal property of this film company, right? Which is correct. Totally, that is weird and a very appropriate reaction. Mm-hmm. And there were lawsuits back and forth about you know uh, being properly compensated for what became a juggernaut hit. Yeah, absolutely. But my thing is this. There are still ways, without saying that event wasn't real, 
that you can get around the problem of of talking specifically about those characters. I think there would have to be. And to go so far as to just throw the baby out with the bathwater, it it destroys the very thing that we are all here to enjoy. I know. We liked the Blair Witch Project. Why are you telling me that it's not part of this? I don't know. I, I really don't understand that. It's very strange. Yes. It's very strange. So where do you know about this Carol Brody stuff that I was asking about from? So in the book... Once we get to the second half, which is all these like journal entries mm-hmm. from the priest Dominic Cazale. Yeah. He talks about living in Burkittsville in the 40s around the Rustin Park kidnappings, around the reveal of the murders. And specifically, he had a couple of run-ins with the Brodies themselves. Mm-hmm. Kyle Brody, they, they present as a, a capital T troubled kid. Cuts the legs off of frogs. Abuses animals. I did not like that description from the documentary either. Not at all. Yeah, a lot of unpleasant. Yeah. Like, it's so funny because, like, in a horror movie, it's good to feel unpleasant. But yeah. somehow, the way it's presented was, like, the sick, depraved side. Yes. Like, the the measurement was off for mm-hmm. me. It wasn't fun to hear the evil. It was sickening to hear the evil. Absolutely. Which is the wrong in- ingredients. Something about the description of a bucket of legless frogs was not doing it for me. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so Carol Brody uh, is very protective of her son, Mm -hmm. which I think is obvious and natural. In the course of the story, Dominic Cazale and Carol Brody grow closer, and it's implied that they sleep together one night. Mm -hmm. And then at Rustin Parr's hanging, she looks up at Dominic Cazale and smiles at him. Okay. That's it. Oh, okay. I, I assumed that that was a reflection of them having this fleeting relationship. She has like an abusive husband, uh-huh. Michael Brody. And um, I thought it was like, well, we had this one thing together mm, okay. around this emotionally charged time. Yeah. Uh, and that was it. It was just there and gone. Mm-hmm. And now she's on the side of history of it's good to kill Rustin Parr. I'm on the side of history that Rustin Parr was innocent. Yeah. We are star-crossed. Okay, I see. That's how I read it, but I also had seen things online that were like, but did did uh, Carol Brody know transitus fluvii? Was she a witch? Yeah. Did she indoctrinate her own child? Yes, that's what I saw too. And I, I thought that it was from the book. Bu- yeah, I don't know. I don't know where people got this then. I don't it was know. just something that I saw on Reddit. It could easily hmm. be a subtext that I overlooked because it doesn't speak to me yeah who knows right i I don't know yeah um but it was certainly not how i took it yeah um in the video game which we'll get to someday on the netherworld dispatch Mm -hmm. um uh you play in the shoes of a paranormal investigator who goes to Birkinsville in the 40s and you see her and you see kyle brody and you see some of how this might actually be a demonic possession of Kyle Brody okay. rather than him being a psychopathic child. Yeah. Um, which is arch enough. Sure. That it plays into the silliness. Yeah. It, that it's made a little it, bit less. Made it easier to swallow. Upsetting. Yes. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Because it's a little bit less realistic. Exactly. I can see that. Um, but so here are some of the things that I thought uh, were good about the book. They're really mm-hmm. just uh, a handful that I picked. Sure. Um, here I talked about D.A. Stern being really good at the historical fiction. Yeah. I loved this. Um, he said at the beginning of the book ish, he talks about the legend of the Blair Witch. You always, you do always need to reestablish things to let people into the world. Yeah, of course. But I love how he let people into the world in this book. He said, uh, here begins the legend of the Blair Witch. This is long past the time of the Salem witch trials which was the 1600s Mm -hmm. and even further removed from the days of the great European witch hunts. Ellie Kedward's execution is a historical incongruity. It is incongruous in other ways as well, because after 1824, the curse becomes as much tied to Kedward as it does to the place where she was abandoned, the aptly named black Hills of Maryland. Um, He's what he's saying is, the Salem witch trials were in the 1600s. Yeah. Ellie Kedward isn't tried and and abandoned in the woods or stretched or whatever you want to view that as until the 1785. Yeah. He's saying it's weird that there was a witch panic a mm-hmm. hundred years past what we think of as the witch yeah. panic. It's true. And I love that he just yeah. calls, he's like, it's weird. Yeah. He doesn't go so far as to like posit a thousand theories as to why. 
yeah, why just there? Like, was it a hysteria? Was it a real thing? Mm-hmm. He's just like, historically, it's out of place. Yeah, yeah. That's appropriately reframing yeah. historical fiction. He calls out the oddity mm-hmm. rather than being like, it must have been Kyle Brody. Right. 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 Like He doesn't poke a hole in it. Right. He's he just highlights something it out. weird that we may never know the truth of. Right. That's what real folklore sort of does. Mm-hmm. It goes, I don't get it. These things don't fit, but they both happened. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Um, and then uh, he talks about the he talks about the documentary itself, um, which I liked. He was like, uh, <laughs> he says the Burkittsville Seven documentary was all about the 1941 killings, but the man's blatant disregard. He's talking now about the character Chris Carrasco. Okay, the man's blatant disregard for the physical evidence against Rustin Parr. Yeah. His obsession with poor Kyle Brody and the way he skimmed over or ignored every piece of the puzzle that didn't fit his point of view. Well, it wasn't what I expected. That could almost be D.A. Stern's actual opinion of the Burkittsville 7 documentary. Yeah. That it goes too oh, hard. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe. But D.A. Stern, again, I think, perfectly plays this this note of like... His character takes issue with the character's viewpoint yes. in the documentary. Yeah. I think D.A. Stern. How crazy. What a like layered thing. I know. Yeah. D.A. Stern often gets this all correct, mm-hmm. in my opinion. Like the way he presents right. differing viewpoints. Right. The documentary, again, to your point, makes it sound as if it literally is supposed to reveal to you that Kyle Brody was evil. Yeah. And D.A. Stern's like, it's weird to me that they said that. Yeah. Good. Yeah, totally. Appropriate. Well yes. done. Uh... And then here's it, the book all amounts to this transitus fluvii. Uh-huh. He sees it burned on. Uh, Even just the words transitus fluvii. I don't know. <laughs> funny to me. <laughs> it is. It is funny. Yeah. Uh, you can hear Dan Aykroyd saying it. Yeah. Well, totally. of course, it was written in transitus fluvii, the, the <laughs> witch's cipher. Um, <laughs> God. Sweet. It's Yeah, I know. <laughs> so he sees these runes on the priest's skin mm-hmm. deeper than the burns. Mm-hmm. He had runes on his skin. Not dissimilar from Book of Shadows, Blair Witch yeah. 2. P.S. Everything we're talking about this week actually happens before that movie comes out even. Yeah. So he's like, why are the runes all over this guy's body? What's going on? And we essentially discover that uh, through the priest's journal, Rustin Parr also had these runes appearing on his skin. Mm-hmm. And he tried to burn them off his own skin. Oh, yeah, I read that. Yeah. Essentially being like, you know, fire gets rid of all the evil. Right. Therefore, in the modern day, the priest, seeing himself and his wife getting covered in these symbols, flies to the extreme, okay. sets her and himself on fire. Mm-hmm. He wasn't setting themselves on, he wasn't set, lighting a blaze for them to be in to suffer. He was trying to use like the it was a Lord's cleansing fire. fire. Yeah. Yeah. It was supposed to be a cleansing fire. But to the entire world, it would look like a depraved, insane murder. Yeah, like an act of violence. Yes. Yeah. And that, again, I think is the appropriate witchy yeah. debate. Mm-hmm. Was it a good fire or a bad fire? Yeah. In the real world, it's always a bad fire. Yeah, right. But when witchcraft is involved, his... it starts to play with people's interpretations. Yes. And that, again, is why I think D.A. Stern knows how to set something up and deflate it in the same breath. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Right? He he's, yeah. He killed his wife in a fire to help her. Mm-hmm. And then somebody goes, well, what do you believe, D.A. Stern? Mm-hmm. And the book ends with him uh, going like, it took me a long time to answer. Book ends. Hmm. He never says his response. Huh. Because interpreting the truth is more complicated. Yeah. Because he understands all the context that went into the choice the priest right, made. Right. If the priest the believes pieces. that they're becoming the witches and they may be, you know, like tormented to the end of their days and go to hell or something. Right. Setting yourself on fire per his logic yeah, made more the sense. Move. Right. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. And the weirdness is good mm-hmm. in my estimation. Yeah, totally. The way it's presented here at least. Yeah, I can see that. Now the the last thing I want to say about Kyle Brody and Rustin Parr mm-hmm. is that it's been referenced in several bits of Blair Witch lore that it's like somebody being like, Well, Rustin Parr was, you know, a hermit who lived out in the woods. Mm-hmm. When people go missing, obviously you blame the hermit. You scapegoat the weird guy. Yeah, yeah. Right? But now, with the documentary in this book needing to flip it and say, um, Kyle Brody did it, 
Uh-huh. It's like, oh, good. So they're they're saying, you know, Rustin Parr was innocent. We're not scapegoating him. But now we're also setting up Kyle Brody was baby sociopath. Yeah. So it's like being neurologically different. Oh, yeah. That... They're, they're just re-scapegoating again. Right. They're not pointing at an innocent and saying it was the innocent you didn't expect. They're saying he was a weird kid. Yeah, totally. Yeah, they're just finding a new stereotype kind of to pin it on yeah yeah it's, it's weird to me yeah it's it's not helpful in that yes. way and again it's why you don't keep returning to this exact story all the time yeah the more you complicate it the less pleasant it is mm-hmm. Blair Witch is weirdly like a fairy tale yeah it's fairy tale folklore mm-hmm. you, you can't really know these things and the more you pick and the more you try to say here's what really happened the more you destroy the enjoyment of The Blair Witch Project. Yeah, it's just going to make it messier and messier. Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't have much to say about about the the comics. I know. I don't really either. Um, You know, I don't love them. Yeah. Um, They're okay. It's it's interesting that they're out there. Do you know much about, like, the motivation behind them? Like, were the people who made them involved in the Blair Witch Project movie or anything like that? Or is this just a labor of love from people who were separate from all of that that's a good question I, okay. I, pro- I probably should know no i maybe i should know honestly i didn't look it up either but i i took them more at face value yeah. the blair witch chronicles it was four mm-hmm. issues yeah um also in the year 2000 also before book of shadows blair right. witch 2 came out and like really upended the entire table mm-hmm. like i think it's weird that these things say blair witch project didn't happen yeah all of a sudden book of shadows comes along and in primary canon land movies that people want to go to and enjoy yeah it just crushes anything any enjoyment of the blair witch project it just says it's all a lie and then presents something worse yes in substitution <laughs> um I can That's appreciate. So awesome. I think that these comics, again, I'm just guessing, but I think it's probably not dissimilar from the Showtime documentary. Right. It's like there's there's heat on this property. I would imagine. We made one comic book, which you and I covered in episode 300 or 301, mm-hmm. um, uh, that told some of the stories of like Ellie Kedward. Let's do that again. Yeah. People will buy it. Yeah, and and it's a set where they basically are kind of going through time periods, like it's like the 50s, um, and then kind of moving on where different stories are taking place in Burkittsville mm-hmm. that are, I guess I guess it doesn't move on um, chronologically, no, it's, it doesn't. It but it's around, it's very anthology-ish. Yeah. Each issue is a totally standalone story yep. of a different kind of horror story happening in Burkittsville at least partially tied to the rumors of the witch in the woods. Right. Cause I just remember the last one is like way in the past. So it's, it's not, but it does bump like bounce around in time. Yeah. Chronicles Um, one, they're all written by Jen van meter. mm -hmm. Um, and I think that, uh, I don't know much about Jen van meter, but I think they had a great perspective on like, here's how you just tell a tangent. I think the stories themselves are are fine. if not good. Mm -hmm. Um, but so the first one is really the landmark, One, I think. It's about these two guys, their brothers. Yeah, no, that's true. And they tell a story from the 50s of uh, uh, a girl that one of them likes is going out with a guy. Peg is Mm -hmm. going out with Doug. Yeah. But Ken really wants her to go out with him. So Ken enlists his brother Gary. We're going to sneak up on them. They're parking in the woods. You know what parking means. Absolutely. It means necking. It means necking. Yeah. We're going to sneak up on them in the woods. We're going to fabricate a witch puppet. We're going to scare the shit out of them. (laughs) Which is amusing 50s pranker stuff. Of course. In reality, they go into the woods and they can't find them. And then they hear Peg scream. Mm-hmm. So they go running. They end up getting lost for like two hours. Yeah. And when they finally find Doug and uh, Peg, Doug has been disemboweled. <laughs> <laughs> and Peg looks like she's just slumped over, maybe unconscious or in pain. So they try to move her. Yeah. And then her scalp comes off. Yeah. They're both dead. Not doing hot. So now... These two brothers, Ken and uh, Gary, yeah. realize, well, people are going to think we did it. So they cover up the deaths. Mm-hmm. And then one of them enlists in the army to get out of there. Yeah, but then he's like, he's haunted by the woods. Yeah. And so he's like spitting teeth out that aren't his teeth. Which is cool. I think that's awesome. He yeah. keeps being, they're like, what are you spitting out teeth? It's like, they're not mine. Yeah. It was like, ugh. Yeah. And it finally concludes with them sitting across from, uh, uh, well, here's the problem. There's a framework Mm -hmm. here. It's, 
I don't know. Like their whole family now is like just like haunted by the memory of this. Yeah. So they're they're they've all got weird things. There's something worse at play, but I'll get to that probably at the way end. Yeah. Uh, which we're not far from. Yeah. But so they're telling the story of being in the woods and like no one believes them. Mm -hmm. They're like, we were innocent. We didn't kill these kids, but we were there and we're trying to tell you that it's witchcraft. I keep spitting up teeth. I keep (laughs) spitting up bones. Yeah. And I know that they were pegs. Mm -hmm. Have them tested. And the other brother, they're old men at this point. Yeah. Has a black. He's blacked out one of the lenses of his glasses. Yeah. And he he takes off his glasses and he goes, it's because this eye is not my eye. Mm -hmm. I actually wrote it down. He said, uh. Uh, don't you get it? It's not my eye at all. It's hers. She made it hers that night. Sometimes I see what she sees. The patch keeps her from seeing too much through me. She's seen you now. Ah. Knows you now. And then he picks up a knife and he cuts out his own eye. Yeah. And ha- holds it out to the person he's talking to and goes, here, take it. Have yeah. your scientists, <laughs> you know. Uh, Do their tests on this. He says, they'll tell you it was never mine to keep. Mm-hmm. So it's like two guys, one of the woods, they're tortured by the witch and they remain tortured for their whole lives. Yeah. Fun. Totally. A fun, freaky deaky story. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Chronicles 2 is called The Offering. It's mostly about like this older story where it's like people go hunting and if you're going to go in the woods, you leave an offering on a tree stump. Mm-hmm. Um, and these kids mischievously, Mr. Price leaves an offering and yeah. kids come and take his offering away to see what happens. Mm-hmm. And then uh, bizarrely, Mr. Price and his family are ostracized because everyone's like, don't go near them because the offering, he didn't make an offering or his off. It's yeah. ambiguous. Like, I know. He didn't make an offering or did the kids take the offering? I don't know. I think they think that he didn't make an offering. I don't understand how everybody like looked and they could tell, but whatever. Yeah. But so basically people know like he's probably cursed by the witch. Yeah. So they even have like the townsfolk being like a, a presumably a parent says to their kid like, do not go to their house. If they make any food, do not eat it. Yeah. The townsfolk of Burkittsville know that the Price family is cursed. Yeah. And so they just draw a line in the sand. I like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then it concludes very bizarrely. Somebody does a wellness check on the Prices because no one's seen them in a while. Mm-hmm. And when they open the door, Mr. Price is crouched nude on all fours and then growls at them like a wild animal. Right. And they shoot him. Well, and his family is dead around. I'm about him. to say, it seems like he's like eaten his family or something. They present it like three different ways, which is, again, I think is supposed to pr- play with this like, which is the real truth. Mm-hmm. Everybody has a different version of the truth. Yeah. But it just comes off very wishy washy. Yeah. But then it concludes with a fun coda of like, now people leave two offerings one for the witch and one and, for the Price family mm-hmm. at his grave. Yeah. Eh, it's kind of an amusing, again, yeah, it's amusing like a, little story. A headstone stacked with offerings. Also, a nude man on all fours also happened in the Burkittsville 7. <laughs> Kyle Brody. Oh yeah, that's right. Was, like, com- confused to see that similar imagery. Yeah, it's nice to have a theme running throughout. Yeah, uh, upsetting nude men on all <laughs> fours. Sure. Uh, while we're on similar imagery, mm-hmm. in the Burkittsville Seven documentary, a guy puts a hose into a man's face, Ugh. like a beer bong thing, and pours some goo into it. Yeah, which yeah, is like what happens in, at the beginning um, of Book of Shadows. Yeah, totally. That yeah. was weird to me. <laughs> well, it kind of happens at the beginning of Book of Shadows. It's extremely clear. <laughs> it looks terrible. That it's just going, you know. It, it, just going behind his head yep yep like a terrible prank awful yeah. uh chronicles 3 i have the least notes about uh it's essentially almost like a gag to me it's mm-hmm. like set up and payoff very simple yep uh, a group of like wiccans get a call from someone in burkittsville come to a cleansing at my house they go to the house it's got handprints all over it's clearly a blair witchy house they try to do a cleansing but clearly they kick up some dust with the evil with the witch and so then they each die one by one yeah. as if they've been cursed. Mm-hmm. The only amusing thing here is the fake call they get is from... It's from Edward Kelly. Edward Kelly, which is like Ellie Kedward. Yeah. That might just be an obnoxious switcheroo. It is. But I've got this. Mm-hmm. Edward Kelly, in real life, was the name of an occultist from the 1500s oh. and is the actual namesake for Ellie Kedward oh, okay. in this world. That's cool. So, I don't know. That's yeah. Mm-hmm. And then the fourth one, the last one, it's titled Fire, and the, the entire thing is this. Yeah. This is the theme. Quote, if a place can sin, can such a place be saved? Mm-hmm. They say that in the eighteen in 1827, which is three years after Burkittsville is founded, the church keeps burning down. So Burkitt, the guy who founded the town, has a new priest sent yeah. to try to get things in order, fix things. Can you make the people who live in my town a little less 
uh, superstitious. Right. And so he goes, this Matthew Edwards, and he's like, I'll die before the church burns down again. <laughs> all right. We're going to get this place under control. And everyone's suspicious of him. And then he goes, all right, you're all afraid of the woods. Let's go into the woods. I'm going to prove to you there's nothing there. Yeah. And once they go to the woods, the witch starts whispering to everybody in the town to kill him. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I like it. It's all written in like I would like say I like word. the way they depict it. It kind of looks like there's like a ribbon above all the townspeople. And yeah, there are no spaces between the words. Yeah. So it says, uh, I wrote down three. It's him all along, all along. Preacher man <laughs> brings the fire all along, all along. He's what harms you. Bring the fires. I know, I know, I know what needs to be done. You burn the witches is what's done. And so people are like, while he's being like, see, there's nothing in the woods. People are like, like so we got to get this close right? in. Yeah. And even a kid turns to his mom and goes, is he going to make us die, mama? Which weaves into, like, it's both messed up and, and archy and silly. Right. But it's also like from their perspective. If they are afraid that this guy is going to bring evil. And they're like, yeah. he did say he died before the church burned down. He's going to kill us all. Right. They they had time to a post and burn him at the stake. Yes. That's really it. It's like a gag. Totally. Right. So, okay. Here's what I want to end with. Okay. It's the most overt refutation of the Blair Witch Project. Mm -hmm. But it goes further. The Blair Witch Chronicles 1 actually opens with a typewritten letter Oh, yeah. From the characters of that story. Mm -hmm. So those old men again, the one that cu cut out his eye and the one who keeps barfing up bones. Yeah. They wrote a letter to Oni Press, who makes the comic book itself, mm -hmm. which is not dissimilar from like D.A. Stern getting involved in the story. Yeah. And here's something that it says in the letter. Everyone tells us the same thing. The movie was a fiction entirely made up. The movie may well be a hoax or a fiction intended to entertain, but it touches on something that happened to my brother and me many years ago. So already, page one of this comic, the movie you like is not real, but the Blair Witch stuff is real. Right. Here's a story of a Blair Witch thing happening, even though the movie, Heather, Mike, and Josh, didn't happen. Yeah. Weird. It's very weird. But then it doesn't stop, because mm -hmm. there's a, another comic book that came out around the same time of the original movie made by this same company. The letter continues, I read your comic book and saw that though you did not take what happened to that young man, C.C. Malvey, who's supposedly the guy who those events he saw. Yeah. Uh, very seriously, you at least did not ignore his story. The kids at the comic store tell me that your comic is itself a fiction. That may be so. Okay. So to reiterate. Yes. The movie, quote, the movie may well be a hoax. Quote, kids tell me that your comic is a fiction. That may be so. Right. This is all fake. <laughs> Two times in this letter. Two times they say yeah. everything you saw is not real. They're really driving the point home. They keep hitting this note that the Blair Witch <laughs> is made up, is fictional. In every possible medium. While saying, but this is going to be real. Yeah. And it's not as good. I don't know. I don't know, man. This, uh, it's a mess. Yeah. It's a mess. And, and again, to some degree, I can respect the ambition or the swings mm -hmm. that they take in a handful of these things by complicating real life does get further complicated. Folklore sure. does get com complicated when you look at it. Yeah. But this doesn't feel rewardingly complicated. It just feels messy. And then it just becomes this amorphous truth. Yeah. That it's hard for you to hold on to at all. Absolutely. I'm very intrigued by this tertiary lore. <laughs> Because, again, you either like something or it's a cautionary tale. That's right. how I look at it. Mm -hmm. This is yeah, like yeah. The, the cautionary tale of going this deep without having the full clearance to really make big statements. Yeah, no, it's true. Someone high up the chain said, we have to say the movie didn't happen. And it has this knock-on effect of everything else that turns everything into yeah. Swiss cheese. Yeah. It is so strange to me. It's bizarre. It's I, bizarre. Yeah. It's so weird. Well, there you go. That's our first, that's our really, our first step into the deep lore. Yeah. I, I'm very curious to know. I already had said we're pointing to the back of the stadium and saying we're going to go all the way. Mm -hmm. do, do you want this? Are you willing to go further? I'm willing to go further. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. It's interesting to me. Yeah, totally. I will not stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm willing to go there. Okay. All right. Yeah. That's what I'm most concerned about. That documentary, yes. I was like, if it's more like this, there's one more special. Mm -hmm. There's really? one more. Okay. Yeah. 
<laughs> I know. How? And it, it's supposed to tie more into Book of Shadows. Oh, okay. So I I'm listening. Know, it's the second and final. I love Book of Shadows. Uh, 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 TV special mockumentary that was written and directed by Ben Rock. Okay. And I'm very, very curious about it. Mm-hmm. I think that's going to be the centerpiece next time. Okay. Um. Yeah. So there's going to be a next time, everybody. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) All right. Well, there you go. There you go. (laughs) There it is. So thank you so much for joining us. We hope you enjoyed the episode. Like we said before, go to patreon.com slash gttupod. Check out everything there. And you can find us on social media. I am at Chillin' Kristen. I am at The Myth Traveler. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcast, mm-hmm. putting some stars on Spotify, write a tweet, write a post, what have you. Again, if you need more Blair Witch from us, scaryfun.fun slash Blair Witch. Yeah. That should self-populate every time we talk about Blair Witch. It'll all be condensed there. Direct links to any time we did it on Patreon as well. Genius. Um, and follow at GTTU Pod on all social media. Did you just say that? No, I didn't. Okay, so then yeah. do that. <laughs> uh, so we'll be back next week for more scary fun. Mm-hmm. But until that time comes, we must travel. Back to the netherworld go we. We, 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 we. I have to go we, we, we. I have to we. go we, we. Now, I heard that the uh, the symbols in Rustin Parr's house in the first movie mm-hmm. don't mean anything. Okay. But I do wonder, and I'm sure there's an answer somewhere, if mm-hmm. Ben Rock specifically found a way to make mm. them make sense by oh, creating his own language, Transitus Fluvii. <laughs> <laughs> The Laskian Stragoi I should, I was, I was of Blair just Witch Lore. Going to say that I'm going to learn that the way Bam learned Laskian Stragoi. <gasps> we should write letters to each other in Transitus Fluvii. Oh yeah, we should. <laughs> and post them online, see if people can solve them. Yes, yes. Like, it's easy. I'm sure it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>